I uh, just want to briefly talk about Mass Fiscal. The goals for today introduce uh, Jennifer Braceris. Uh, Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance advocates for fiscal responsibility, transparency, and accountability in state government and increase economic opportunity for the people of the Commonwealth. So we hold uh, elected officials accountable and oftentimes we also hold policies accountable. Today's uh, discussion town hall is gonna be on vote by mail, the program for Massachusetts. The goals are to educate the public, you the audience on the specifics to vote by mail, uh, teach you and hopefully share with you how you can hold the program accountable. And of course, wanna thank you for having an interest in this important topic. Um, as I said, my name is Paul. I am on the board of Mass Fiscal. With me is Jennifer Braceris. She is also on the board of Mass Fiscal. Um, I actually have Jen's bio in front of me. So I'm just gonna kind of hi highlight some points. Uh, Jen is a political columnist and a senior fellow with the Independent Women's Forum in Washington, DC. She is a former uh, commissioner for the United States Commission on Civil Rights. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School and often Jen writes for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe and a lot of other uh, publications on issues that deal with law, politics, and culture. She has a quite an impressive career in the private sector at several firms in Boston, and she's taught a uh, lot at some of the local colleges. Uh, very happy to have Jen with us today. She's been on the board for several years. Uh, thank you, Jen, for moderating today's panel. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, so just so everybody knows how this is going to work, we have two panels today. John Fund and Han von Spakowski will be giving us the national perspective on vote by mail, after which we will um, hear from two members of the Massachusetts legislature, Senator Ryan Fatman and Representative Nick Baldiga, and they will speak specifically about the state of play here in Massachusetts. Each panel will have approximately 20 minutes, and when the four are done with their presentations, um, we'll have time for a brief Q&A. So we will kick it off uh, with our national panel, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our guests. Um, John Fund is the national affairs reporter for National Review. Prior to joining National Review, John spent more than two decades at the Wall Street Journal, where he was a member of the journal's editorial board from 1995 to 2001. In 2004, he wrote Stealing Elections, how Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy. The co-author with fellow panelist Hans von Spakovsky of the book, Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk. And that's from Encounter Books. Um, Hans von Spakovsky is Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He also manages the center's election law reform initiative where he writes about campaign finance, election integrity, and the enforcement of federal voting rights laws. He is a former member of the Federal Election Commission and a former counselor to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Department of Justice. I, I believe that must have been under Ralph Boyd, is that right? Uh, that's exactly right, yes. Ralph, Ralph is an old friend uh, and a Massachusetts I wouldn't say native, but he spent a good part of his career here. So um, we'll have to chat about that offline afterwards. Um, okay, so John and Hans each have 10 minutes. And um, if it's okay with you gentlemen, let's start with John Fund. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate this opportunity. Hans is going to go into a lot of the specific details of the problems with uh, mass or unlimited mail-in voting. Uh, I'd like to go into a little bit of the cultural and some of the um, antecedent um, problems that come with a complete shift to mail-in voting, as many people are advocating. First, I'm from California, and we've always had mail-in voting and absentee voting. And uh, now, of course, it's expanded dramatically. So I'm familiar with its popularity, and I'm familiar with its advantages. But I think a lot of people have not really had a firm debate on what we're giving up when we go to all mail-in voting or mostly mail-in voting. The constitution refers to an election day, our statutes refer to an election day, and they never contemplated turning that election day into election month preceding 
uh, the election day in which many states send out ballots uh, before the debates for various offices are concluded and election month after election day because it takes a lot longer for the ballots to be counted for the ballots to be adjudicated and of course there are opportunities for litigation that don't exist with in-person voting so election day becomes election months and I just would point out that everything in our society today happens faster uh, than it ever has before. Everything from getting food delivered to your house uh, two hours after you ordered on the internet uh, towards uh, you know, renewing your bank statements uh, on the, uh, online. The one thing that has slowed down dramatically is reporting election results. When there were things like newspapers delivered to front doorsteps, you could open up your newspaper in the morning and read who had won the election. And in states that have dramatically improved their election procedures, like Florida, uh, that's still possible. Uh, Florida still primarily votes in person. It has streamlined its election facilities. And all of Florida's votes were basically in by 10 p.m. turn 30 uh, at night on election day last November. Contrast that to California, where they were still deciding who had won in the race 30 days after, or New York, where a congressional race wasn't decided until uh, just last month. So the member had to be seated, Claudia Tenney, 30 days after the rest of Congress had been uh, seated. So there's a lot that you give up. In addition, uh, I think that mail-in voting uh, that goes beyond the traditional absentee ballot standards uh, changes the whole nature and form of campaigns. I've already mentioned that a lot of people have the opportunity to vote before the debates are finished in various states. And I think you lose something because why do we have a campaign if we're not trying to influence voters' minds and perhaps bring issues to the fore and have a debate? Uh, we don't just have elections so that one block of voters allied with one political party can turn out and one block of voters allied with the other political party then turns out and we see who has the more. Uh, we have campaigns for a reason. And what, what do people tell us they dislike about campaigns? They dislike the length of the campaign. They dislike how much political spending takes place. Uh, they dislike the increasing influence of consultants and pollsters. And what does mail-in voting bring with it? It brings all of the above. Because in the previous arrangement where people were voting at the polls primarily, all of the campaigns came down to a focal point. All of the campaign energy, the campaign resources, uh, the campaign grassroots volunteers came down to getting people to turn out on election day. That is completely diffused if you have uh, half the vote, two thirds of the vote cast by mail. Uh, that means you have to basically have several mini campaigns. You have to have a campaign for those who are voting just after the ballots are mailed out. Then you have a campaign for the next week. And then you have a last minute campaign for last minute mail-in votes. Uh, this is more expensive. This involves more polling, more consultants, and frankly, stretches out the amount of time and energy and frankly, TV commercials that people are going to be subjected to. And I don't think people realized that that's one of the things that comes with moving to a mail-in campaign. So there are legal and constitutional questions that I don't think have been fully adjudicated going to all mail voting or mostly mail-in voting. There are issues of whether or not people have a real ability to make an informed decision if they're voting three weeks in advance. For example, last minute issues comes, come up uh, in, the, in the campaign. Uh, scandals can come up in a campaign. Uh, but if you've already voted with, except for a couple of states where they're extremely cumbersome processes where you can try to change your absentee vote, uh, you're basically, once your vote is cast, it can't be with taken back. And lastly, and this is something that I think uh, deserves some specific attention, mail-in voting relies on one of the least efficient, most cumbersome, and frankly, least functional bureaucracies in our country. It's called the post office, uh, the US Postal Service. Now, the US Postal Service doesn't like to admit this, but their internal documents show that uh, between one and 2% of the first class mail uh, is either never delivered or delivered very, very late. And in fact, 
uh, networks from NBC to CBS to NPR conducted experiments on mail-in voting. Uh, they would set up post office boxes. They would send out letters to people shaped uh, letters to that post office box shaped like an absentee ballot, the same weight as an absentee ballot with first class postage on it, and they would see what happened. Now, we don't know exactly how many absentee or mail-in votes never reach their destination. It is true that some states allow you, if you go onto the computer, to track your ballot, but the vast majority of people never do that, and the vast majority of people would never know if their ballot had arrived too late or had never arrived at all. I'll just conclude with telling you of one experiment that CBS News did in Philadelphia, which was a swing state. They mailed out 100 ballots, and they mailed it to a post office box they had in Philadelphia. And they waited 10 days and then they went in and they looked at the box and there was nothing there, nothing. So they went to the counter and asked, Are there, do you have anything for that post office box? No, they went to another counter, they went to another counter. Finally, they went to the supervisor and the supervisor seeing that there was a reporter there with a camera and the red light on said, well, maybe I should pay attention to this issue. So he went in the back room and after five minutes you could hear on camera the following voice saying, Oh, that's where they are. Then he brought out ballots, of which there were only 46 out of the 100. 46. Now, eventually, 97 of the ballots did come in, uh, but it, they straggled in over a period of between 10 days and 21 days. And then the question becomes, what about the three ballots that never made it? Uh, first of all, the, if they had been real ballots, they probably wouldn't have been counted. A lot of elections are decided by less than 3% of the vote. And I really wonder, if we're not going to fix the problems of the Postal Service, do we really want to surrender uh, the future of our elect electoral democracy to an institution that is so dysfunctional, so non-transparent, that we really don't know how much of the mail is lost, stolen, or strayed? And that's even before we get to issues of potential fraud and intimidation that accompany mail-in balloting. All right, I, I guess uh, I'll pick up where John has left off. Jeff, will you, will you give me like a one or two minute warning, please? Uh, since we've only got 20 minutes. Um, to, to emphasize what John is saying, the Inspector General of the Postal Service issued a report, um, I think it was last year, in which they specifically uh, looked at their delivery of election mail. That means absentee ballots. The, the, their goal was 96%. In other words, the goal of the Postal Service was on-time delivery uh, to, to, to achieve that 96% of the time. Now, their national average got close. It was like 95-something percent. But that meant that even if they achieved their goals, 4% of absentee ballots uh, would not get delivered on time. And as John said, uh, that could decide a lot of elections besides disenfranchising 4% of the voters who, who voted that way. If, if we voted in a polling place and election officials said, well, we're discarding 4% of the ballots cast, everyone would be very upset. The worst jurisdictions in that IG report delivered election mail on time in the 80th percentiles which means that a very large number of absentee ballots would not get delivered. Um, that is just one of the problems with absentee ballots. By the way, I took a look at Massachusetts. Um, the US Election Assistance Commission files an official report every two years on federal elections based on survey data from the states. The data on Massachusetts shows that in the last four federal elections, that's not including last year's election because that data is not available yet, but basically the uh, 2012, 14, 16, and 18 elections, Massachusetts election officials listed over 68,000 absentee ballots in a category called unknown. What that means is that individuals requested an absentee ballot, election officials put it in the mail to send it to them, and then election officials have no idea what happened to the ballot. It wasn't returned. They didn't get any calls from the voters. So we don't know if the voter suddenly decided, well, I'm not gonna bother to vote it, whether it never arrived and never was delivered. We just don't know what happened. And that's again, where the problems with absentee ballots. But look, here's the other big issue. No one disputes 
that uh, we need absentee ballots for folks who aren't going to be able to make the polls on election day because they're out of town, perhaps in the military, or they're too sick or disabled to get there. But you need to understand that absentee ballots are the most vulnerable ballots, not only to misdelivery or non-delivery, but to um, potential fraud. Uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement about a decade ago issued a report after a whole series of absentee ballot fraud cases had been detected and prosecuted across Florida. And they call them the tools of choice of vote thieves. And the reason being that they're the only kind of ballots that are voted outside the supervision of election officials. And, and I know transparency is very important to this organization outside the observation of poll watchers. That makes them more vulnerable, vulnerable to being stolen, to being altered, and to voters being coerced and pressured in their homes. If you think that doesn't happen, then I would suggest you take a look at the 2018 congressional race in North Carolina. We had one contested uh, race after the 2018 election. It was in the 9th Congressional District. That election was overturned and a political consultant and his members of his staff were all arrested and criminally charged for engaging in absentee ballot fraud. And also in uh, basically coercing, pressuring uh, the voters, getting their ballots. Uh, fortunately, they were caught. Uh, last summer at Patterson, New Jersey, the very same thing happened. They switched to an all male election, supposedly because of COVID-19, even though that really wasn't necessary because of the pandemic. Uh, four individuals are criminally charged by the state attorney general's office with engaging in absentee ballot fraud, including a candidate, and an election was overturned because of the fraud. Does this happen all the time? No, but absentee ballots are more vulnerable uh, to this kind of misbehavior. Look, we maintain an election fraud database at the Heritage Foundation. It is simply a sampling of cases from across the country. It is not a comprehensive list because I don't have the resources uh, to, to do that. Um, it includes, by the way, and, and by, by, when I say election fraud cases, I mean proven cases where someone was either convicted in a court of law or a judge uh, or a court ordered a new election, or there was a finding uh, by a state agency such as the State Board of Elections in North Carolina over the uh, 9th con uh, Congressional District, right? It, it includes, by the way, a conviction of a former state representative in Massachusetts uh, a few years ago named Stephen Smith, who was obtaining the absentee ballots of voters without their knowledge or consent and then voting them. The, the security protocols for absentee ballots are also uh, very lax. In many states, Massachusetts is one of them, there's not only no ID requirement, there's not even a witness signature requirement. And if you think that signature comparison is a sufficient security protocol. Uh, let me just tell you three things about that. Um, do that. Election officials simply don't have that. They also don't have the amount of time needed um, to do that uh, when they're looking at lots of absentee ballots. The, the Las Vegas Review Journal last year did an experiment in which they submitted nine ballots with forged signatures. Eight of them were accepted by uh, local election officials. Um, I was at an election conference in Oregon some years ago where the head of, uh, of the elections department there was bragging about how wonderful their all-male system is. Oregon is one of the states where you don't show up to vote, they simply mail an absentee ballot to every registered voter and wait for it to come back. As, as the official from Oregon was talking about how wonderful their system was, an election official from another state leaned over to me and said, well, my sister-in-law lives in uh, Oregon and she voted three times the last election. I said, well, how did she do that? Well, she voted and signed her ballot and mailed it in. She voted and signed her husband's ballot and sent it in. And she voted and signed a third ballot uh, because she was registered twice, once under her married name, once under her maiden name, and the state had no idea that that was happening and was, it went completely undetected. Um, a professor at Portland State University some years ago did a survey in just one county in Oregon 
as a graduate project and asked uh, their students to uh, do a survey. 5% of individuals admitted that someone else had filled out their absentee ballot and two and a half percent admitted that someone else had signed their ballot. That may sound like a very small number, but that translated to the rest of the state was literally tens of thousands of ballots. Uh, I have a colleague at the Heritage Foundation who moved away from Washington State, another state with uh, all May elections, eight years ago. Her sister moved away 10 years ago. Uh, Every election, her parents tell her that ballots show up for her and her sister uh, that is sent to them because they're still on the voter registration list. They could easily vote. The state would never realize it because they believe they're still there. That points out one of the big problems we have, which is notoriously bad voter registration lists. And uh, sending out absentee ballots, for example, as mail-in ballots do, as, as mail-in states do to every registered voter list means that literally thousands of ballots will show up in neighborhoods, apartment buildings, condos for people who no longer live there or have died, uh, have moved out of state. And unfortunately, there are people out there who are willing to take advantage of that. So overall, uh, we should stick to uh, voting in polling places where there's better security and we have the transparency and observation that we need for a fully open system. Thanks. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, John. Uh, that was very helpful. We're gonna segue over to the state panel now. Um, and I think most people on this call know that here in Massachusetts, Governor Charlie Baker just signed a bill extending no excuse mail-in voting until the end of June. And most Democrats on Beacon Hill wanna make this permanent. So here to talk about that proposal and explain their opposition to it are two members of the state legislature, uh, Senator Ryan Fatman and Representative Nick Baldiga. Uh, a quick bit of background on these two gentlemen. Since, since <clears throat> 2014, Ryan Fatman has represented Worcester and Norfolk districts in the Massachusetts Senate. He is the first Republican to win an election in this district since 1938. Prior to his election to the Senate, Fatman represented the 18th Worcester District in the Massachusetts House and served on the Board of Selectmen of the town of Sutton where he grew up. Nicholas Boldiga represents the third Hamden District in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, which includes the city of Agawam and the towns of Granville, Russell and Southwick in Western Massachusetts. He is the ranking Republican on the House Financial Services Committee and he was previously a member of the Southwick Board of Selectmen and Parks and Rec Commission. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Senator Fatman. And um, after Senator Fatman's remarks, we will hear from Representative Boldiga. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I think what we have to start with, with uh, our ballot and election system, um, really for us and Nick and I started in December, um, you know, as absentee, uh, universal absentee ballots, no excuse ballots came through uh, as Massachusetts policy to address, um, you know, COVID crisis and the public health crisis. Uh, on the back end of it, we decided we would reach out to the Secretary of State um, to do sort of a, a SWOT analysis um, to understand the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats, uh, to this system, um, many of which have been outlined uh, by Mr. Fund and his counterpart. And, um, you know, we sent this letter December 8th to the Secretary of State's office asking to answer a series of questions. Um, you know, questions that you would assume uh, the Chief Election Officer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would be able to provide some data or information for. Um, you know, and I have the letter right here. And basically, you know, we asked about how many uh, registered voters were mailed applications to request no fault uh, mail in ballots for both the primary and the general election. And then how many bounced back as undeliverable in both elections. Um, the post office outlines 25 reasons why uh, something bounces back in the mail. And so we wanted a categorization of, you know, how many fell into each uh, reason of the 25. 
Um, we were wanting to know if there was any audits done on voter signatures, um, as was previously alluded to. Um, that might not even be that efficacious uh, as, as a policy. Um, we wanted to know how many, uh, the total financial cost of the program and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, we sent this letter and, and as you can imagine, uh, we didn't hear anything back. Um, there were no answers to any of the questions. And as members of the joint elections committee, uh, we found this incredibly disappointing because when we had uh, the original policy debate back in May of 2020 in the hearing for the election, we had a nine, nine hours worth of testimony um, and including from the secretary of state's office. Um, and they said that they were going to track a lot of these um, data points and try to report back. Um, so, you know, fast forward to March, the beginning of March, uh, the speaker of the house announced that he was going to push forward legislation um, to endorse extension of mail-in voting and allowing municipalities uh, to change their election dates based on, you know, sort of where we stood with COVID-19. And, um, you know, so we basically sent the letter to the speaker and said, hey, the secretary of the state has not responded to these questions. And before we move forward on making this a permanent policy for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which so many elected officials are, are sort of jumping to that conclusion, but we need answers. And um, so we took a stand in the Senate. Uh, the Senate Republicans actually blocked the bill uh, for about a week. That was the temporary extension of mail-in voting and municipal uh, municipal governments being able to change their elections. And essentially what we said was we need to have a public hearing. And uh, we forced public testimony to be submitted um, to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, and that was successfully done. Um, you know, some of the things that I think stick out in Massachusetts when we consider this policy. Uh, we know that 18,000 ballots in September for the primary were basically thrown out. Um, you know, we don't really know all the reasons why. We know that um, at least, I believe, 57 of them were thrown out because the person was uh, not was registered in two states um, or, or had duplicative registration, uh, which you know, might only be 57 people, but that's a really concerning um, fact. Uh, second, you know, we don't know, at least it hasn't been reported, how many ballots in the actual general election were thrown out. Um, they estimated it would be over 50,000, um, but that's 50,000 people potentially who are disenfranchised who did not get to vote. And as we know, uh, the franchise of vote is one of the most, is the most sacred thing we have in this nation. Um, and so getting information about those things is really important. Um, after we sent our second letter and after we were able to force public testimony, uh, we did receive a phone call, uh, a whistleblower from the Secretary of State's office. And they informed uh, myself, Rep Baldiga and Rep Lombardo, who we all served on the election committee in 2020 together, uh, that the Secretary of State's office potentially was housing um, several thousand ballot applications that had bounced back. And they had so many that they couldn't store them um, in the Ashburton building where the Secretary of State's office is located and that they had moved them sort of um, clandestinely to the State Archives building. So yesterday, uh, me and my colleagues, we actually showed up at the building and we were told that they're down in room 149 uh, and we asked if we could go down there um, to as joint members of the election committee to see if there was any validity to this um, you know after being blown off for probably about 30 minutes uh, while we waited uh, we were told that there's no public access to uh, that room uh, but that there was indeed uh, ballot applications that had been bounced back and that um, or being stored there. What's really interesting about this is um, after we sent our second letter requesting the information uh, from the Secretary of State's office, they said that it was actually impossible for them to answer these questions. Um, well, if yesterday's experience proves to be true that there are a numerous amount, perhaps thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands 
of absentee ballot applications that bounce back and are being stored in the Commonwealth's archive system, um, we now know that it's not that they couldn't answer, it's that they wouldn't answer the questions. And um, I think when we're creating policy and trying to figure out the best way forward, uh, we need to consider greatly, um, you know, the data points uh, that we all um, are really interested in learning about, including, you know, how many people had their ballots bounce back or their applications bounce back, and how many people potentially didn't get to vote who maybe wanted to vote, um, you know, which potentially is a, a failure of the system. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which I, I find interesting, you know, uh, for Nick and I, we, we represent a lot of smaller towns. Um, you know, we've had about $80 billion from the federal government flow through Massachusetts during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but these policy decisions have financial costs and eventually that money goes away. Um, if you extend mail-in balloting in perpetuity, it is an expensive program. And so what is the opportunity cost um, that you're willing to pay for that? Um, you know, it could be significant. Uh, a lot of these towns feel that they were not properly reimbursed by the state in trying to execute the program. And beyond that, uh, what, one of the interesting points, uh, just on data, we broke records, um, as many people did, for the voter turnout. We had about 3.685 million people vote. Uh, but what's really interesting is when you look at sort of the PD43, which is the Secretary of State's numbers, um, and match that up with the municipal reporting, there's about 90,000 votes short, um, and they don't match up. And I don't know why that is. Um, I don't know if it's a failure to report. I don't know if it's inaccuracy. Um, but that's just another concerning data point that needs to be addressed in understanding um, all these issues. So um, we're going to continue to try to dig and find answers to these questions um, so that as we move forward and we create this policy, um, if we move forward with mail-in balloting, uh, that there's definitely more security. Uh, you know, one of the amendments that I had tried to file, which I think was common sense on the local level, uh, these ballots, when they're mailed in, get to be processed earlier, meaning, you know, before the election, they're opened up. Um, that is very concerning. And one of the amendments I used to try to address it was to allow the local election commissioners to be notified when the town clerk or the city clerk opens these ballots so that as the appointed members of the elections uh, committee on the local level, they can supervise. Um, and in theory, you know, they're supposed to be members of the Democratic Party on there and members of the Republican Party on there um, to provide balance and equal access. And uh, that's really important. Uh, that, that amendment failed. Um, you know, why? I'm not sure. Uh, the, the talking point against it was, well, it would create too much of a burden on, on the local clerks. Uh, all I wanted is to make sure that, A, they were able to be notified that these ballots are being processed, and B, where they were being processed and that they could show up if they wanted to um, while that was happening. So uh, there's a long way to go here in this policy debate in our state, and uh, I know that Nick and I and others are committed to continuing uh, the effort to get answers to the questions of the last year. Thank you, Senator Fadman. Uh, Representative Bolziga, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, yeah, I wanted to first say uh, thank you to Paul and uh, the board and you, Jennifer, for hosting this this morning. Uh, thank you, John and Hans, for being here with us. You had some great input. I really appreciated it. And Senator Fatman, of course, it's always good seeing you, my uh, former friend and classmate back from 2010. Um, you know, I just wanted to start off with, I think that we can, we can all agree uh, that the most important thing here is access to voting. I mean, it's, our, it's a right that we have. It's something that we hold sacred in this country. Um, and I believe that we're all on the same page, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, we want easy access to voting. We want transparency in the system and we want security. And, you know, from the, from John's first comments, I mean, I couldn't agree uh, more with some of the things that John mentioned. We've now gone on to when, when you mail in ballots, this was the first year I know for me and obviously the Senator when we're campaigning, we had to take all this into consideration, obviously running for office because now your, your campaign is literally extended by a month. And then you're possibly another week afterward that a week after election day that it could be extended to bring in ballots and count them. So, you know, you're, you're targeting different people. You know, I, I find it that, you know, people, um, I'm out there, I'm knocking on doors all the time. People are pretty annoyed by it. Um, I remember one phone, phone call I got from Phyllis 
I give out my home phone number. So Phyllis called and left a message saying, Mr. Boldiga, you've called me eight times. I, I voted for you two weeks ago. Please stop calling. Um, so, I mean, these are the things that we're up against because the timeline has now changed. But a lot of what I heard today through um, the just mail-in ballots, but also just ballots in general. Um, I think we're living in the stone age. You know, So for instance, with mail-in ballots, what we saw was we were literally, towns and cities were literally putting concrete blocks outside of city hall and putting metal boxes on them. So you could drive up and put your mail-in ballot in it and they would drop it in there and then bring it inside and count it later on because a mail-in ballot can't be counted on election day. Um, we have uh, such amazing technology at our hands these days, which would literally get rid of everything we talked about this morning. Um, if you see this thing right here, it's a cell phone. We do all of our banking on here. It's secure transactions. Everybody knows that this is a secure device where you can deposit your checks in there. You check your bank statement. This provides the most easy, transparent, access and a secure way that we could vote as moving forward. I mean, right now we're sending rovers to Mars where we're, our satellites have less, left the solar system right now, but yet we are literally living in the stone age when it comes to voting. And it's absolutely a sacred right that we have. It needs to be transparent and secure. And the way that we're going forward, we're going to do that is, I believe is technology. Um, we can save hundreds of millions of dollars, not only in just in Massachusetts, but across the country, probably billions at this point, we don't have to worry about the ballots being lost in the mail. We don't have to worry about applications being lost in the mail. We don't have to worry about someone who lives in two different states voting twice or three times under their maiden name because yes. under the emerging technology that exists and throughout the Hello. country right now, blockchain technology is, is an instance for one, you can tie someone's ID to their residence, their phone and blockchain technology to make it sure it's 100% secure and only one person, one vote only matters and it's the way forward. There's no other way right now with ballots we're talking about, with mail-in ballots, with lost ballots. I mean, this is literally the, uh, the stone age. Um, you know, and one of the other things about mail-in ballots was we heard, so you go to the polls on election day. Clerks were calling us because the people that are poll checkers are usually retired elderly people that work for free. They're volunteers. They're worried about getting COVID. They're not coming in. They're too, they're too old to sit there for 18 hours until the votes are cast, until they're counted. We're going on a week. Things about mail-in ballots, absentee ballots. When do we count them? Is it postmarked the day of? Is it postmarked a week after? I mean, so the conversation I believe we're having is the wrong conversation. We need to pivot off of this. I believe we're years, years behind on the technology that it comes to implementing 100% secure ballots across the country. I think we're losing time right now. Mail-in ballots, I think, are a one way, and I hope it's a very small way in the future going forward that someone could cast a vote. I think the way to do it securely is technology. We have all the technology at our hands and our fingertips right now to implement secure elections across the country, and we're not doing it. For instance, in New Hampshire, they have, show, they have voter ID to vote. So one of the things about voter ID is it somehow became this partisan issue. When I don't really think it's a partisan issue. Everyone wants secure access and transparent elections to be held. And the way to do that is whether you're a Republican or Democrat, unenrolled, a libertarian, is to make sure that we have that easy, transparent access to voting and that it's secure. And by a paper ballot, paper ballots are never going to be secure. Like you said, they're either counted wrong. I know, for instance, several, I have one community in my district that still hand counts ballots. So we're relying on human, human nature and human error to hand count a ballot at midnight when these are elderly volunteers trying to hand pick through ballots to, to determine whether or not the bubble was filled in correctly. But yet we have blockchain, blockchain technology as one example that's 100% secure. We could secure our elections right now and not have to worry about this going forward. Everybody's ID would be attached to their, their number, their vote. You could cast it right on your, on your app on election day. We'd no longer need to go to the polls. We would save a ton of money, a ton of time, uh, a ton of work on our clerk's behalf, a ton of employees. Everything would be secured and counted by 8 p.m. on election day. Not the week after, not the month after, not two weeks before. You could see live results going forward and it'd be secure. Um, you know, these are some of the things that I think we need to really focus on going forward and pivot, come together as a nonpartisan issue as to why we all want secure elections. Um, so I think the points I heard her, heard her today just further uh, motivate me to kind of really pivot off mail-in voting or just paper ballots in general as the mainstay 
of how we elect people in this country and do it in a much more secure way with the technology we have available at our fingertips to move forward and make our elections secure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'm a little more old fashioned than you, I don't know, but I, I actually have a lot of concerns about voting via the phone, um, particularly the way it would impact older voters who might have trouble with that. Um, and I actually think there's something to be said for requiring people to show up on election day. I mean, if you, if you don't care about it enough to you know, go to your polling place and cast a ballot, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be voting is, is my view. I mean, it's, I don't feel like it's something that should be done. And, and that's absolutely your, absolutely your view, Jennifer. I disagree with 100% on everything you said. Um, I'm sure that you do your banking on your phone. It's secure. You'd never think twice about taking a picture of your check. I do it all the time. Uh, my 93-year-old grandfather just got a cell phone. He's on Facebook. Uh, so, I mean, the, we have the technology. We, representative, we do, we do potentially have the technology. However, I would remind you of one important distinction between your banking and your potential voting procedure. The government is in charge of the voting. And if you really believe that a government procurement agency is going to do this job properly the first or second time, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I can sell you. Now, uh, we have lots of computer experts you who have looked into every your, aspect of government that well, way. If I could just finish, uh, that's right, which is why we probably should think twice about extending it to another new area. Uh, the Pentagon and various other government agencies tried to set up internet voting several times with pilot programs for U.S. servicemen overseas who, of course, deserve a vote. Uh, they concluded, and computer experts have, including those at MIT in Massachusetts, concluded that this procedure is fraught with peril and is probably many years in the future. Now, I will just give you an example of how the government has handled voting so far. We've, we, I'm not going to get into the controversy about electronic voting machines. I will just make the following observation. Your bank, where you do your banking, and, and, and where you might have your ATM access, they spend approximately eight to 10 times more on that machine and that technology than the government doing low cost bidding does. And I would have to tell you, if you believe that you can force the government of Massachusetts, which operates according to standards, which I think are circa 1930, if you could force them into the 21st century overnight, uh, good luck to you. And I would celebrate that. But there is a reason why government voting machines cost only one eighth that of banking. That's because, because they, they have, work. they don't, they, well, sometimes they don't work and sometimes there's controversies about them. And at the very least, they are much cheaper versions of the best technology. If you actually believe that you can force Massachusetts to leap from, 20, from 1930 to 2021, you know, very quickly, more power to you because I don't, any state that's ever studied this has concluded uh, this is a long-term process that will probably take a generation. Well, and, and in fact, in fact, so many of the objections that um, were raised by the national panel about problems with mail-in voting um, would apply equally to, to digital voting and that it can be- the whole conversation let, me finish, finish, let me finish, let me finish. Inherent flaws of mail-in mail -in voting, but we want to stick with it. I don't think it's the right way to go. And I would absolutely- oh, No, we, I'm not, I'm absolutely not arguing that we should stick with it. I'm like, just- Like I'm Elon like, Musk with technology. Outsource this to a business, obviously, to get this done. But the conversation we're having this morning is about the inherent flaws of mail-in voting or ballots in general. So correct. And correct. And one of the flaws of mail-in voting pointed out by the national panel is that when you don't have to show up at a polling place to vote, some people can be unduly influenced by spouses or relatives or activists who come to the door into casting a ballot that they might not otherwise have cast. Right. And the same would apply with, with uh, you know, digital voting. But if, if, putting that aside and, and sticking to the question of, of yep. and the same why mail-in voting is bad. If you don't think that someone's not uh, influenced by their family members, whether it's electronically with a cell phone or a ballot of who they're going to vote for, I think each and every one of you has probably said to a family member, you're voting for who? Well, I think you should vote for this person. Right, that and, the difference, and the difference is when you go in to vote and you close and you vote.
The, the difference is that we have a secret ballot in this country and no matter what you tell your husband at the breakfast table, when you go into the voting booth and close the curtain behind you, you can do whatever you want. But yeah. putting that aside, I'd like to ask a question of the and national that's something that, I wish that the technology would advance doing. Right, so we're not here to argue about electronic voting. So I'd like to ask a question of the national panel. Um, and that is, we are often told by the media that Republicans don't like mail-in voting because supposedly it advantages Democrats and that, that therefore our opposition to it is strictly partisan. Um, uh, I, I'm gonna to have to jump I, off in a minute to go to another uh, event, but I will just answer that briefly yeah. before Hans might weigh in. Right. You know, it, it is certainly true that until about five or six years ago, Republicans were advantaged by absentee voting. It was Republicans, especially seniors, and people who were consistent voters who would use absentee voting. There were no moves by Republican legislatures or Republican governors to expand the absentee program. It basically remained the same with a couple of exceptions such as Arizona. So while Republicans were advantaged by absentee voting and this was generally accepted by all political scientists, there was no dramatic move to expand it. There was no dramatic move to take advantage of, a, of, that, of that fact. Now that Democrats have, I think, leapfrogged over Republicans and are advantaged by the organizing that revolves around all mail-in voting, we see this desire to, in some states like Oregon, Washington, and others, to go to all mail-in voting and basically eliminate the polling place. My sister can't vote on election day. She can drop off her ballot somewhere, but she cannot vote in a polling place on election day. So I think that while there certainly is partisan advantage here, I don't think that that primarily motivates uh, the opponents of mail-in voting. Hans, yeah, and, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, what, what I would say is there's actually a study that just came out, John, I, I, I know you've seen, there's actually a study that just came out that it contends that uh, the increase in mail-in voting didn't actually help uh, Democrats in the last election. So I think that's kind of a matter of dispute. My, my concentration on this is that uh, mail-in validating is, is the most vulnerable form of, of voting, and it's subject to all kinds of problems. And I, I'd like to say to the senator who is, he's, he's on the right path when he's trying to get the rejection rate numbers, particularly from the state, because that those who want to extend voting by mail are in essence saying they want to disenfranchise voters. And the reason I say that is um, the rejection rate for absentee ballots is always higher than the rejection rate of ballots cast inside a polling place. Even the New York Times admitted this about eight years ago in a big article about the absentee balloting process. And the reason for that is, is very straightforward. Um, if you're in a polling place and there's an issue, there's an election official there who can answer your questions and resolve and remedy the problem. But with absentee ballots, uh, if you don't complete it exactly the way as specified, if you don't provide it, the information that the state requires, you know, your registered name, your address, if you forget to sign it, if you don't follow the steps carefully, your ballot is going to be rejected and your ballot is not going to count. And that's why in every state, the rejection rate with absentee ballots is higher. That's a, just another reason why we should be minimizing the use of absentee ballots and not trying to expand it. Because if you do expand it, more and more people are going to have their votes not count. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions coming in from our audience. This one I think is for the um, state panel. It's from Michael Kane, who he actually asked two questions. Um, the first is how is the citizenship of a new voter applicant verified? And he also asks who controls the ballot from the time it leaves city hall until it returns? Uh, would either of our state legislature legislators like to take a crack at that? I think that's a really great point, Mike. Um, one of the concerns that happened late in the election cycle, or, uh, I believe after the primary, was that the Secretary of State, according to the law, had to launch an online registration portal. And that portal did not require a signature under the pains and penalties of perjury. Um, and so there was an, sort of an open-ended question about, A, you know, what type of access could be gained 
to being able to vote because most voting registration happens at the local level. Um, you know, the vast majority of it, you go into your town hall and, and you register to vote that way and you provide, you know, your documentation. And a lot of times the town clerk, who's a local person, um, you know, knows where you live. Um, you know, sometimes that might be a little bit different in the cities. Uh, I, there's one thing I wanted to point out, and, and I think that it's um, another question just when it comes to uh, security of ballots that I failed to previously you know, back in September as well, uh, we learned about all these ballot drop boxes. Um, you know, a lot of towns were utilizing, a lot of cities were utilizing. And you had in the city of Boston, someone light ablaze one of the ballot boxes that were, you know, for deposit. And that was something that never came up in testimony when we were discussing this back in May about crafting legislation. Um, and, you know, that's a real significant concern. Uh, you know, we, we've seen acts of violence and, and terrorism in this country. Um, you know, according to a lot of people, there was an injection of, you know, um, meddling in our elections in 2016 and 2020 by foreign nations. And, and what is what? Why wouldn't we think that someone would try to vandalize ballot boxes in order to throw our elections into chaos? Um, Hans's point too about the disenfranchising of people, I think, is valid because look at locally, uh, just out in my district, uh, in 2010, there was a state representative race that was decided by one ballot. Uh, representative Peter Durant won the election by one ballot, and you know then it went to a recount, and that ballot was dismissed um, that they identified, and they did a whole new reelection. And so it was thrown out in court. Um, you know, what happens in a close election where perhaps four or five ballots that could decide that were submitted uh, were, were rejected, uh, that were mailed in? Um, you know, so there's significant efficacy issues when it comes uh, to our election process. Uh, but one of the big concerns that I have uh, moving forward is that open-ended portal from the Secretary of State's office allowing people to register uh, perhaps um, too leniently. And uh, that's another thing that we have to get to the bottom of. Could, could I address the citizenship and the Dropbox issue? And if, would that be okay? Sure, that'd be great. And, and by the way, uh, we just added a case recently to our uh, election fraud database of a city council race in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, where in fact, ballots that were improperly rejected were found because of a lawsuit to be valid and it changed the outcome of the race. So that is not a far-fetched thing. On citizenship, that is one of the biggest problems we have in American elections. No election official anywhere in the country does anything to verify citizenship. So it is extremely easy for someone who is not a citizen to be registered, to vote, and to not get caught doing it. And we have found many cases of that that are in our database, and there are many other um, uh, good reports that that's occurring all over the country. The problem with drop boxes that I don't, don't think people understand is this. There's nothing more dangerous than having an unmonitored, unsecured drop box for um, absentee ballots to be dropped in, not only because of that kind of intentional you know, destruction, but because it makes absentee ballot fraud easier. The reason for that is that, again, going back to last summer, Patterson, New Jersey, absentee ballot fraud case, four people criminally charged, the election overturned. One of the reasons that was discovered was because 800 absentee ballots, which had been completed, were found in a neighboring town in a U.S. postal mailbox. That was what led to suspicions that there was fraud going on because there weren't 800 people living in a neighboring town that didn't weren't enti were entitled to vote in this particular uh, race. It was clear that those were fraudulent ballots that had been deposited in that mailbox. If you just have drop boxes unsecured, then the folks in that race who stole that election would have simply been able to drop their 800 ballots in the drop box and nobody would have realized it's a problem because that's what the drop box is for, absentee ballots. 
Jennifer, may I expound upon one thing that Hans sure. said too? Uh, that's that's a great point. And I want to point to a local election in Central Mass, the town of Grafton. Uh, they placed a two and a half override um, for the schools and the general operating budget uh, in the pandemic time period where mail-in voting was law. And they had the election, determined that the election was over, uh, that the override had passed. I believe the average property tax increase was about $275 per household. Um, about a week and a half later, after the election was certified, they found about 200 ballots in a vault that had not been counted, that had been mailed in. Um, the reason why I bring this up, and I, I, you know, I don't believe, I, I believe that was human error um, more than anything. However, when we had the public testimony back in May about no fault mail-in voting, there was a policy analyst from Tufts who I think sagely said the biggest problem with mail-in voting is that it could undermine democracy and the trust and faith in our system. And you saw that happen in this past election, uh, rightfully or wrongfully, whatever your thoughts are, there are, when you look at public polling, nearly half the country believes that there was fraud in our voting system. Uh, that is a very dangerous thing. And it spoke, it speaks to what this individual from Tufts was trying to convey is that if we, our system, our, our democracy, the currency of it is trust in many ways. And if we undermine that um, and we start thinking that we live in a banana republic and, and that there's fraud happening everywhere, it, it's gonna undermine the legitimacy of our elected leaders and, and our, who are making our laws. And that's a major, major policy problem. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. I think the, the last about 10 minutes, we've said the same thing, you know, the round, the round, the roundabout of, you know, ballot boxes being destroyed and tampered with uh, human error of 200 ballots that were probably just not counted on unintentionally left in a room somewhere. Uh, people standing outside the polls and lines being harassed by people and intimidated about who they're going to vote. So I think what the what I'm also hearing is, is that so we need to elevate our, our, our thinking around how we do vote. And whether or not that's if you want to continue down the road of ballot boxes being destroyed, ballots being lost, mail-in ballots never getting there in time and, and actually impacting an election of who's elected and who's not, we have to start thinking about how we're going to by one by one by one systematically get rid of those concerns. Um, and like I said, I think it comes back to utilizing technology. I filed a bill right now uh, this session to study impl implications of how we can use secure technology to do that. And there are other ways to do this, or these are going to be the same conversations we're going to be having forever. So, I mean, it, start, it's, it is time to start to have new conversations in new ways we can get rid of these concerns as both Republicans and Democrats and unenrolled to make sure our voting process is secure. So I, I think we're... Time is almost up, but we have one more question, which is specifically for Representative Baldiga, um, and it comes from George Beats Us from Agawam, and he wants to know how realistic is it that the House and Senate um, will be able to stop permanent uh, universal voting by mail, and he also wants to know where Governor Baker stands on this issue. Hi, George. Thanks for tuning in. It's good, good to have you here with us. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take it first. So obviously, I haven't heard anything from the governor on it. But as, as you very well know, there's a, a merry band of, I believe, three Republicans in the Senate and, uh, you know, a couple of dozen in the House. So obviously, the, if, it's a, if it's a partisan issue, um, the Republicans wouldn't have any ch a chance of stopping that bill. And what you've heard is from, uh, from the Democrats and obviously the Secretary of State that absolutely they want mail-in voting to continue and be universal. And probably in a couple of terms, if not this next term, I'm guessing that the, the play will be that since the other issue is, is that since we don't have technology available to us, we have to fight tooth and nail, like the Senator said earlier, to even try to get information from the Secretary of State, which we don't get. So we don't have any information because the Secretary of State doesn't give it up. We have no recourse to get that information about how many applications were mailed back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're so far behind the ball on this that I would imagine that in the next term, um, my colleagues across the aisle here in Massachusetts will say that the first go around in 2020 was so successful, we don't even need to mail applications anymore. Let's just mail ballots. 
So in two years from now, the same panelists will be back here having the same conversation about this time though, it wasn't ballots, it wasn't applications for ballots that we found in the archives building. It was ballots that we found in the archives building because we're not thinking outside the box here and thinking of a much larger picture of how we can secure these elections for everyone involved in this attach ID to vote involved in the process somehow, which is not a partisan issue. It's a safe, transparent, secure issue. So several years from now, I'm gonna imagine we're gonna be having the same conversation because we're kind of stuck in this way of ballots and partisan issues and back and forth when we really need to come together as Democrats and Republicans and figure out how we're gonna make all of our elections secure. Thank you. And Senator Fatman, would you like to close it out? Anything else you'd like to add? So I saw a uh, question in the comments. Um, what are the next steps to gain access to the room in the archives building in Boston? Um, so we got on the phone. We were told that we needed to call and ask direct permission from the Secretary of State's office. Uh, we did that while we were in the archives building. Uh, the nice woman on the phone said, I can't give you permission for that. The, only the secretary can. You're going to have to do a public uh, records request. And when we receive that public records request, we will then allow you access to the room. Uh, my understanding is they have 10 days uh, to respond. And hopefully all those ballots have, or ballot applications haven't left room 149 um, in that time period. But um, they did say that they were there and they said that they would allow us to view them. And um, you know that's something, A, I wanna find out how many there are and B, I'd like to see who's were rejected and, and for what reasons. So um, still more to come on that and uh, we'll keep plugging away. I wanna thank you for your leadership on this issue, Senator, because nobody should be opposed to getting these questions answered, regardless of where you stand on the issue. Everybody should be in favor of transparency and, and more information before we make decisions about our voting system. So thank you, keep speaking out um, and let us know what we can do to help. And thank you to our national panelists, um, Hans von Spakovsky and John Fund, who I see has left the room. Um, but very good to see you both. And thank you for sharing with us your knowledge on this issue. Thanks for having me. Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists and Jen. Very much appreciate it. Um, I would encourage our audience that if you have follow-up questions, email info at massfiscal, I-N-F-O at massfiscal. Uh, definitely do that also if you want to know when the legislature is going to have their next hearing on vote by mail because it will probably happen some point late spring, early summer. So be prepared. There'll be more on this topic in the near future. Uh, thank you very much, Jen, uh, Hans, Senator Fatman, Representative Baldiga, and um, hopefully we'll be able to stay in contact with our guests today for when the next hearing's up. Thank you. <laughs>